the fifth annual Sustainability Day. Um, I'm Nancy Berto, Professor of Economics, Faculty Co-Chair of Xavier's Sustainability Committee. Campus Sustainability Day activities are happening this month at campuses all over the country. Check the website of the Association for Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, otherwise known as ACHI, to which Xavier belongs, for more information. So today, on behalf of my co-chair on Sustainability Committee, Dave Lococo. Where are you, Dave? Stand up. And uh, he's executive director of Physical Plant also. And Xavier's Sustainability Director, Ann Dougherty. Where are you, Ann? Stand up. There, yeah. OK. And all the other members of Sustainability Committee, could you please stand up? Tina Meeker's already standing with the camera at the back, so consider her having stood. Whoops. Oh, including the student sustainability interns who like to throw their computers around, OK? And all sustainability ambassadors. So if you're wearing one of those cool shirts, or even if you're not, we're our sustainability ambassadors. If you'd stand up. Oh, very good. OK. All right, so on behalf of all these folks, um, we'd like to welcome you to our fifth annual Campus Sustainability Day celebration. Also here today is our Senior Administrative Fellow for Sustainability, Professor Kathleen Smythe. Where are you, Kathleen? There she is, OK. So feel free to share your ideas for sustainability at Xavier with any of us. And please be aware of the Sustainability Committee's ongoing mini-grant program, where students, faculty, and staff can apply for grants of $500 to $5,000 for creative sustainability projects on campus. See the Xavier Sustainability website for details. And this is our uh, website there. And if you forget how to get to it, you can always just Google Xavier Green or Xavier Sustainability, either way, and that'll be your top hit. OK. Um, Xavier's Sustainability Committee, as you could see, represents a cross-section of the campus community working to reduce energy use and transportation costs, increase green space, steward water and organic materials, and make our purchasing and maintenance practices more sustainable. Our committee was created in 2008 when President Michael Graham signed the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, known as ACUPUC. And in 2010, we submitted our first plan for initiating actions emissions of greenhouse gases. I'm going to mention just a couple of examples uh, as representative of our many sustainability initiatives and accomplishments at XU over the past year. Inclusion of Xavier in the Princeton Review's Guide to Green Colleges. Xavier's receipt of a Green Advocacy Award from the Cincinnati Business Courier, the startup of two, three new undergrad programs in sustainability, a BA in Economics, Sustainability, and Society, a BSBA in Sustainability, Economics, and Management, and a BA in Land, Farming, and Community, as well as approval of an MA in Urban Sustainability and Resilience. A series of interdisciplinary field trips with so far five different classes participating the first exhibit of the Sustainability Heroes Gallery, currently on display in Fenwick. Sustainability teams input to the design process for the renovation of Alter Hall and many more. Our program today will feature a presentation by Dr. Joan Fitzgerald and perspectives from Atlanta's Gary Harris and Cincinnati's Larry Falcon on the theme of energy justice in our cities. We're defining energy justice, by the way, as environmentally sustainable forms of energy that are ecologically sound, as well as economically advantageous for all members of society, and especially those that are the least well off. We will wrap up with an opportunity for questions from you. First, we will begin with opening remarks from our provost, Dr. Scott Chadwick, and our thanks to Dr. Chadwick for his continued support for sustainability at Xavier. So welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here today. When I think about sustainability, I ask myself the question, where are we trying to go? How far can we go? What's the scope? So I want to frame this in terms of the vision of the institution and the Xavier Way. And I think we'll see that it all fits perfectly well together. Our vision, Xavier men and women become people of learning and reflection, integrity and achievement, and solidarity for and with others. How do we operationalize that? How do we bring that to life? How do we imbue that with our mission and our values and our ethics and our passion? I think we do it through the Xavier Way. The five pillars of the Xavier Way, learning, reflection, integrity, achievement, solidarity for and with others. What does sustainability have to do with that? I'd say everything. 
Sustainability is a way that cuts across all of those pillars, and it emboldens them and supports them and will make them come alive. When we think of doing this from an Ignatian way, I think we have to start with Ignatian imagination. We have to use all of our senses. We have to use our intellect, of course. We have to build relationships. We have to come out of a place of love and not fear. We have to get out into the world and feel and smell and see and taste. If we do that, then we can pull back and we, and again, in an Ignatian way, become contemplatives in action. We can see the world, we can reflect on it, we can make sense of it, we can take it down to our values, and then we can use that to go out and act on the world. Where does that lead us to? It leads us to a place of consolation. When we feel the spirit, from whatever faith tradition, you feel the spirit come alive in you, you feel the connection to the living planet, and then you do something about it. You move toward the good. Ultimately, it ends up in oneness, in seeing God in all things. Now, the vision statement says, Xavier, men and women. So it's not just about students. It's about all of us, and then it's about the institution. But let's start with the students, because our mission here is to educate. So let's frame this in education. The first of the five pillars, learning. Helping students understand the complexity that is out there, the interdependency of all things, the unintended consequences as we act in one area upon another area. Helping students understand and gain the ability to listen and to know the facts well enough to know what is fact-based and what is not fact-based. The ability to defend the position, the ability to engage in discourse and to argue from a place of values and love and care. To have an ability to create or to hold the paradigm of abundance rather than a paradigm of scarcity. We can show in reflection, knowing how to reflect in an Ignatian way, whether you're doing it in quiet or while in action, alone or with other people. Knowing enough about sustainability to frame it in pure personalis. For all other people, and I would dare say for all other sentient beings, we are all in this together, and we need to reflect on how our behavior or our lack of behavior affects the rest of the world. Truly becoming contemplatives in action, being leaders in a thoughtful, value-based way. We can show the students how to do that. Integrity, being honest about what is and what is not, being honest about what is known and what is not yet known, what might just be conjecture being transparent in our actions and our intentions, being open to all sources of information wherever they come from, and then developing consistency in action across the many roles that all of us play day to day to day. We can show students how to do that too. Achievement, learning through the core, through the majors, through the minors, through things that happen outside of the classroom, and then doing something with now and doing something with it later. Most students, when they graduate, will not go into a career in sustainability, but each and every one of you students will be affected by this. And each and every one of you will have the opportunity to affect sustainability initiatives, to affect policy, to affect politics. You must know about this so that you can act on the world. And you can do it while being men and women for and with others certainly you will go out and work. But for whom will you work and why will you work? That's where your integrity comes in. And we can show uh, people how to do that and how to do it as you achieve. And finally, solidarity for and with others. To go out into the world and be with. To see the world from other people's eyes. To smell the world as they smell it. Not as a tourist, not as dropping down for a day or two, to really to be immersed with people and to live their life for a while and to understand and feel the joys and the sorrows of that. To be for them, to advocate for them, especially those who cannot advocate for themselves because they do not yet know how or do they, they do not yet have the power. That's our responsibility. That is our obligation coming from a university like this. To nudge people, not to pull them, not to push them, to nudge them, to let them be the authentic human beings that they are. To be humble, yet to be strong. 
we can show the students how to do that. I think all is possible. I think if we continue this movement on campus and we stand together, we can do this. And I promise you, I will stand with you and I will walk with you on this path. Hi, I'm Gabriel Gottlieb and I teach in the philosophy department. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to Xavier's Sustainability Day and particularly excited to welcome Joan Fitzgerald, Director and Professor of Law and Public Policy at Northeastern University in Boston. Today's event ties together two ongoing lecture series. The first is a series of talks dedicated to thinking about the future of justice. The second is a series on energy and sustainability. Our hope is that today these two series cross at a crucial juncture, that is, energy justice. In her most recent work, Emerald Cities, Urban Sustainability and Economic Development, Joan Fitzgerald tackles a series of issues that are often dealt with separately, economic development, environmental sustainability, and social justice. In Emerald City, she raises an important question. In her words, quote, how can policies promote sustainability and decrease greenhouse gas emissions be implemented in such a way that they not only contribute to urban economic development, but also push forward the equity agenda that is at the root of progressive economic development? This is certainly the right question. One that recognizes that our social and environmental problems are themselves not discipline specific and cannot be understood and solved from only within our own disciplinary boundaries. They require diverse perspectives, tools, and resources, as is, as is evident from Professor Fitzgerald's work. Professor Fitzgerald has published extensively on economic development and sustainability. Emerald Cities, published in 2010, examines how cities in the US and Europe are handling issues of climate change, sustainability, and economic growth. Emerald Cities builds on her co-authored volume from 2002, Economic Revitalization, Strategies and Cases for City and Suburb. Recently, Professor Fitzgerald co-edited a three-volume set on cities and sustainability. She is currently planning to exp expand on her work in Emerald Cities in a new book that will deal with sustainability and innovation. As I understand, we might get a sneak peek at how her new project is developing. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joan Fitzgerald. Thank you for having me. Uh, it is a delight to be here and hear about all of the sustainability initiatives you have ongoing at Xavier. And um, for me, it's an opportunity to reflect a little bit, although I have to say the assignment you gave me wasn't easy in that some of the people will have read the book, some of them won't. So I can't assume anything um, in giving this talk. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Emerald Cities, but as you hinted, take it to the next steps of where I'm going with the new book, uh, Greenovation. Um, Emerald City started in Freiburg, Germany, and um, I introduced the book by saying it wasn't the book I intended to write. I wanted to write about my frustration with how slowly I think U.S. cities are moving on sustainability. And that was back in 2008 when I started this research. And I'd have to say now, um, I had notes up here. I think someone took all my notes. <laughs> I probably don't need them, but just in case. They were in stack. <laughs> What's that? Don't Thank agree. you. Is that the beginning? That, that's the beginning. All right. um, so anyway, my frustration that U.S. cities were moving so slowly. And the argument I make and I made and I still make is that what most cities are doing under the banner of sustainability are making them less unsustainable, but not really putting them on a path to sustainability. Um, so what would that path look like? So that was the intention of, of the book. Um, but when I got to Freiburg, I realized that the political environment in the United States 
um, was such that the way to make the case for sustainability was to make it as an economic development argument. And that's exactly what I saw going on in Freiburg, Germany. Um, this is a small university town, 200 and, about 220,000 people. Um, and what motivated uh, their dramatic move to become the green city or Freiburg solar city was in fact um, the threat of a nuclear plant. And they succeeded in, in having that nuclear plant stop but realized, well, we have to do something. So they decided to become completely green. So you see in this slide some of the elements of that. Um, we talk about bike paths in the United States, but I don't think you want to go to any train station and see that many bikes um, parked there. And we talk about public transportation, but I don't think in most cities you see the number of tram lines that you see on this slide, on this slide here. And I don't think you go into most districts and notice solar arrays on top of buildings that look like this or like this. This is what taking sustainability seriously looks like. This is Vauban, a former military base that was developed into a whole green community. And they decided, if we're going to do solar, we should do it big. And we should do it as economic development. So we should create demand for solar by putting it everywhere. And then we can have solar manufacturing and create jobs in, in, in the city, and that's what they did. You'll see the tram path down the, the center of the area. And what's really interesting about how they did it is in urban planning, we talk about carrots and sticks and using that to shape people's behavior. So the carrot you see going down the line, a nice tram line that connects to the old downtown part of the city, uh, the main part of the city. What's the stick? Well, if you live there, you can't park your car in the neighborhood. Just a little more view of what solar looks like. Um, thought I had another slide. If you want to have a car, in fact, you can only put it in a parking garage outside of the community, and that costs about $26,000. Um, but you get a free tram pass, and um, you can use your bike. So that's big time carrots and sticks. And we don't do that kind of planning. Um, in the United States, and perhaps that's a good thing. Um, it's, it's certainly something we can debate. But anyway, what I saw was a city that took it so seriously that their stadium became solarized. They're exploring ways to put solar panels on older buildings, historic buildings that don't disrupt with their, with their historic nature. This is a simulation, but it's a pan, an array over, over the train station. So you go to Freiburg and you see, as soon as you enter the city, this is a city that's on a path to sustainability. And as I mentioned, if you look, here, the, this is Solar Fabric, one of the first uh, manufacturers in the area. And what's interesting, what I like about this picture, is that it shows a cloudy sky. Germany is not the sunniest country in, in Europe, and it's not the windiest country. But because of policies that were developed in cities and then assumed by the federal government, Germany became a leader in solar and wind technology. And you can't do that if you don't adopt it internally. It's a big link in policy that needs to be made. So I decided to go back and write a very different book to look at, OK, not just renewable energy, but what about green building and energy efficiency? What about recycling and waste to energy? What about transportation? How can we make that triple bottom line link? Economic development, environmental justice or equity, social justice, and ecological development. So those were the sectors I looked at, and then I chose different strategies. What I know as someone who studies economic development in cities, you can either link these goals to something you're already doing. You can transform industries that you have in your economy to from, from um, say, um, green build or building supply to green building supply. Or you can just leapfrog, create whole new industries. So then I traveled around, interviewed people, 
and looked at what different cities were doing and came up with the cases that I used in Emerald Cities, looking at um, these sectors. So one of the interesting things when I started this book, I thought the place where I would find the most solar going on in the country would be Austin. In fact, the place that had the largest solar production facility at the time was in Toledo, Ohio. And I was a little stumped. I couldn't figure out why in the world would it be in Toledo, Ohio. So I looked at what was going on in Austin and Toledo. Well, in Austin, there was a lot more political support from the mayor, the council on down for developing renewable energy. There was a city-owned utility. You can't imagine what an advantage that is for a city in that um, the city can tell the utility you will buy this amount of renewable energy. University of Texas at Austin, the flagship University of Texas, doing research in this area, creating an incubator there, research partnerships on grid technology, incentives for solar production. Uh, so everything you can imagine as someone who studies policy in cities put in place was right there in Austin, Texas. What did you have in Toledo? Well, you had economic development focused on new technologies, um, which was very important. Also university research and an incubator. But how could that be? What was going on there? And in particular, when I looked at Austin, from its incubator, there was one solar manufacturer. In Toledo, First Solar, the world's, one of the world's largest producers of, of solar piano, um, solar thermal technology, Zunlight, another company, more than 6,000 people. Now this is not enough to turn around an economy in, in as much crisis as Toledo. But what was interesting is that Toledo specialized in auto glass. And it was because of this specialization that it was able to build on solar technology. Now you might say, what in the world is the connection between auto glass and solar panels? But if you think about it, what is auto glass? It's glass, it's layered, you put antennas in it, you put shading in it. What is a solar panel? It's a glass product. So through the auto glass industry, research started at the University of Toledo that ended up with First Solar being uh, locating there. This company was formed in 1999. It's the world's largest leading thin, thin film solar manufacturer. So it's the first company to break the a dollar a watt manufacturing barrier. So um, if you read Emerald Cities, you'd say, this is pretty good. Toledo's got a good thing going for it. Um, so, but what happened was in 2011, First Solar announced it would build a $300 million factory in Mesa that would open four production lines, or I'm sorry, in Malaysia. Um, and what happened? Those solar panels it produced there were sold back to the United States. So suddenly this little facility in Toledo that only produced, um, hired 600 people wasn't looking all that big. So a couple years passed and the solar industry kind of went under a little bit in the United States. China got into the game, offered incredible incentives for companies to locate there, um, undersold solar panels on the world market, and now we have a glut. So we're kind of starting fresh again in the United States. So we have some good news. First Solar announces it's going to build a $300 million plant in Mesa. So, okay, it's not Toledo, but we see economic development coming back to the United States. But by the time this $1.3 million square foot building was finished in early 2012, First Solar was laying off employees and scaling back in its factories around the world. In April of 2012, First Solar announced it would lay off about 2,000 people globally, about 30% of its workforce. In October 2012, it announced it was looking for a tenant to occupy half of the facility it just built in Mesa, Arizona. So again, we look at what happened with China, a glut on the market, not by virtue of mistakes that Toledo made or mistakes that Mesa, Arizona made, um, but just to the fact of what's going on 
in, in the world economy in, in solar. So the United States has put some import tariffs on the Chinese production panels. We still have a glut in the market. So the lesson here is that when I started with Germany and looked at the policies that were there in place at the EU level, at the city level, at the federal government level. Um, similarly in China, there's a big federal government push, national government push to develop these industries, to build renewable energy. We do not have the equivalent in the United States. In fact, in our Congress, you know, we have elected officials that deny the existence of climate change. So we have fallen quite behind in these technologies. And in all of our talk about reducing federal spending, we have reduced the amount that's going into research on these very important industries of the future. So let's move on um, to see if we can't paint a more, uh, a different story with some of, some of the other uh, companies that we found. This one was Zunlight, also started in Toledo, Ohio, if you, if you read the book. And here's the husband-wife team that created this. So these are thermal solar panels that can be embedded into building materials. Um, it was a proof of concept thing. And the interesting thing, and I think the big lesson I learned here is this company is still alive and well, thriving in, in Toledo, Ohio. But what I learned from this company, from the head of economic development, it wasn't like Austin where it was, we're gonna build renewable energy it was, we are going to innovate, and I'm going to do everything I can to get researchers who are innovating new products to get those into production. Because when you look at this couple of scientific researchers, what do they know from developing a business plan? So what they do is help the researchers, the innovators, get to the point of a profitable business. And this is one of many profitable businesses alive and well in Toledo. This is um, a solar array that they put on a highway, beside a highway, that would normally be a place where glass and litter collect and is now solar panel. They're testing it out, and it proves that it does work, and this could be used in highways throughout the country. So what's going on in Toledo since then? Well, Johnson Controls, a maker of traditional batteries, decided it's going to expand um, and invest $138.5 million in a new facility to make lithium ion batteries. Um, and Toledo is considered one of the top 50 places in the country now uh, for green jobs. Again, this is not going to revitalize the, the economy of Toledo, but it is a start. And what it shows to me is a focus on innovation is where you want to go at the local level but that you need a policy ladder to support that. Now, I understand at lunch today, uh, one of the policy ladders you had in Ohio is, is under threat, and that is a renewable portfolio standard that you have at the state level that tells utilities in the state, by a certain year, you have to buy a certain percentage of your energy from renewable sources. And I guess your local utility is lobbying pretty hard to have that reduced. So that policy piece you have in place that's helping Toledo, Cincinnati, and other cities is being threatened right now. So what other lessons can we take out of that? Well, Austin didn't become a solar producer, but San Antonio did. So sometimes it's all in the timing. Not much different in terms of I would make a list of what San Antonio did and what Austin did. But what we have is another municipally owned utility in San Antonio, CPS Energy, signed a deal with OCI Solar Power for the construction of five solar plants around the state. And if you look at those, you see the scale of these is enormous. The deal is going to bring about 805 jobs um, to the area, the San Antonio area, paying about 47,500 a year. And there's where the social justice piece comes in, because these are manufacturing jobs. They're highly skilled manufacturing jobs, but they don't require a college degree. So they're living wage jobs 
uh, for people who otherwise would only have access to service sector jobs in the area. Part of the agreement calls for a $100 million high-tech solar component manufacturing plant that Nexalon America, as you can see from the executive there, is building. So over a period of four years, we will see these uh, plants phased into the area. The other part of it is there's a 25-year agreement that CPS, that is the utility, agrees to buy all of OCI's power for the duration of the contact. So very similar to what I saw in Germany. They're creating the demand for the renewable energy produced. So um, this has been a wonderful partnership. Um, what else has happened in, in Austin in terms of innovation and economic development? They didn't become a solar producer, but remember I mentioned the political will. And this is where it's interesting. They kept it up. So one of the things they had started with this is something called the Pecan Street Project. And the idea was to make Austin America's clean energy laboratory and to develop a model for urban power systems of the future. So we have the city of Austin, their utility company that's municipally owned, the Environmental Defense Fund, the Chamber of Commerce, Austin Technology Incubator, all working together on this. So it's a genuine public-private partnership. And what they're focusing on is the grid. Because one of the things that, that we hear with renewable energy, both wind and solar, we haven't quite the developed the storage technology yet. And one of the things, you saw those solar plants in the, middle, in the middle of nowhere, same thing with wind farms. Solar and renewable typically aren't where the people are. So you've got to get the power there. So if we're really going to develop renewable energy sources, one of the things we have to do is have a smarter grid that can get the energy to where the energy users are. So what is a grid? It's an interconnected network for delivering electricity from suppliers to consumers. And it's kind of a hard to understand concept because we use the same word to, to describe every scale of the grid. So it could be the entire continent's system is called the grid, a regional transmission network. You can see the nation is divided up into regions, or the sub-network, such as your local utilities, wires that get uh, power into your individual houses. So the problem we have, as you can see from this map, is the nation's grids are just this patchwork of local grids that are simultaneously inefficient, wasteful, and dysfunctional. So even f without renewable energy, we have a huge infrastructure problem with our electricity grid. And so we've got a lot of congestion on many of the lines. And in the book, I talk about specific problems that happened with wind energy in Texas. So what makes Texas, and Austin in particular, such a lucky place to do this kind of grid research is they've got their own grid. And that enabled them to become a leader in this. So if we want to move power uh, around, we've got to figure out within one system how to get it from congested areas to places that places don't need, that need it. Um, so one thing this requires is smart meters, and this is another where, area where Austin was a leader. Almost every household in Austin has a smart meter. So smart meters accompanied with smart appliances uh, mean that households can receive information from the grid, and it allows energy be, to be shifted away. So if you are hooked up with a smart meter, what that means is if there is a peak power day, okay, 95 degrees, everyone wants to turn on their air conditioner. Those are the days that a utility has to be prepared for. So even if there's only five days in a year that require that much power, your utility has to be able to, to power it. So you can see why energy efficiency and conservation are so important, because if we can just reduce power enough that you don't have to build that next power plant, it's really cutting into electric use. So what this smart grid technology it does is allow us to do that. So if you sign up for it, you can agree that you know, while you're not home, your air conditioner is going to get turned down or turned off for 15 minutes. And just by making these adjustments, 
having a smart grid system that allows that can save that, that utility building that. So there's a lot at stake in figuring out how to do smart meters and how to build a smart grid. And this is where now Austin is moving. So what they have done is develop a community. This was an old airport site. It's called Mueller. And it's the research place for the Pecan Street project. And so this gets me to another element moving toward my next book, is district scale sustainability projects, where a city can go larger than house by house by house, offering you energy efficiency, and integrating a lot of things. Gary's going to be talking about it with Atlantic Station as an example of this in, it, in Atlanta. Well, this is an example. There's all different kinds of examples of these district level projects. And they allow cities to ramp up what they're doing on sustainability. And my argument is they allow cities to move from becoming less unsustainable to truly becoming sustainable. So I think there's a lot at play in looking at these district level sustainability projects. So this, this is where the smart grid research is taking place. Um, is it, is it a great district level? Well, I look at it and think, my goodness, how far away from the city is it? Uh, what are the public transportation mechanisms? Looks like a lot of single family housing to me. So I see a lot of things in that picture that to me don't say sustainability is here. But that's what it's intending to do is the grid research. So part of it is they took this brownfield site. Like I said, it was a former municipal airport that was closed. They built a lead platinum uh, hospital, Dell Children's Hospital. Um, and they built about 1,000 residences there and 75 businesses. There's a hospital, Seton Hospital, headquartered there. And what they're doing is testing systems and in integrating clean energy in smart grid applications. And so it's distributed clean energy, energy storage technologies, um, smart appliances, plug-in electric vehicles. But what they're really focusing on is pricing models. How do we get you as consumers to buy into this? And that's the interesting part, because people don't really want to have to think about their electricity usage all the time. And so how can we get people to really conserve? Well, the answer is you build it into the systems. The other thing they're testing is pricing models how you can price it. So will people really, if they're motivated, if they run their dishwashers and their laundry machines at night instead of in the day in peak hours, and they see significant savings on their bills, will that, will that motivate them to save more? So there's just a lot of experimentation going on within this area to determine exactly what are the strategies to get the public to do the right thing with energy conservation, but at the same time to figure out the distri distribution system for renewable energy system. So here again, we see a public-private partnership, and this doesn't come cheaply. It's about a $10.4 million grant from the Department of Energy and a lot of local business partners involved. So um, we will see what happens with this, but right now, it's looking like they are really making progress on this. So now, let me go to Sweden. Emerald Cities ended in Stockholm. My new book, Renovation, begins in Stockholm. And Stockholm is a city that has embraced sustainability very early on. Why? Because of the oil crisis in the 70s, the government in Sweden decided we are going to be fossil free as a country. And everything the country did was moving toward that goal, including what cities were doing. So they built out their public transportation, carrot. They made beautiful subway stations using local artists, carrot. They built bike paths that really s provide safe ways for, for bikers. You can see the physical separation of the bikers from the street traffic. Good signage, separation of pedestrians as well. Carrot. Couple sticks. Congestion tax. That is, if you want to drive in the center city during peak hours of the day, 
you pay. And you pay more in rush hour times. So that's, that's a bit of a stick, but showed a demonstrated effect in the city of reducing traffic. And so the city, when this was instituted, went from 55% of the people being against it to everyone saying, we gotta keep this pilot project permanent, and they did. District heating. Um, I understand you're on a district heating network here at the university, many universities are. All that means is that you have a, a heating supply, electricity generation, and rather than it being 48% efficient with all the waste steam going out of a, a smokestack, it, go, it gets channeled underneath and is used for heating buildings, can also be used for cooling buildings. It takes you, in terms of efficiency, from 48% efficiency to 85 to 92% efficiency with just that move. Really important doing it citywide in Stockholm. I talked about the importance of district level. This was a brownfield site, an old manufacturing site, that the city transformed into an eco-district. It was a brownfield site, as I mentioned, so the city had to do a complete cleanup of the area. And then they developed the model. It's not easy to see this, but I'll walk you through it. The idea, as you can see, everything's coming back. It's called a closed loop. And that means everything you use up, rather than getting wasted, comes back. So what does that look like? Well, starting with public transportation. So they, they um, built a, a tram line from the main subway station with four stops. Carrot, everyone wants public transportation. Stick decided we're not going to put a lot of space for car parking. So we're putting about 0.7 parking spaces per unit of housing. In the United States, that's typically two or more. Um, there's the train line coming in, free ferries where you can take your bike to the downtown part of the city. Experimentation, another important aspect. When I showed you uh, Freiburg, Solar, you see it everywhere. You see different types. They're experimenting to see what works. Stormwater management, talked about that today as a problem here as well. Often cities have integrated sewer and, and um, stormwater systems. They get inundated and, and flood. What this is, is builds a stormwater system that's about, um, that separates it and does natural stormwater um, management. And if it gets too bad, um, being a coastal city, then there's a whole system of canals to connect the overflow. This is my favorite part. This is a um, company, a Swedish company called NVAC that created this vacuum system. If um, you still have drive-in banks and you know the system where you put your, your money in and this tube sucks it out, well, it's kind of the same thing except it goes underground. So he's taking a cornstarch bag that's completely compostable, and that's compost going in there. And the other one is recyclables, and the other one is burnables. It goes underground to one central processing facility, and what happens is the combustible waste is incinerated in a waste-to-energy plant, and that heat is put back into the district heating and cooling system. So your garbage becomes a source of energy. That's renewable energy. Heat from wastewater, same thing, goes back into the heating and uh, district system. Then the, um, the compost is made into biogas, one product that you get from it, and the biogas goes back and fuels the city's bus system. They're hybrid buses that run on biogas. And the other byproduct of composting, uh, of organic waste recycling is compost. And so it produces compost that goes back to the system. So again, you see this whole integrated system where all the waste gets recycled and built back. Here's what the, what the community looks like now, fully built out. And if I had time to elaborate, you see all of the principles of sustainability in this eco-district demonstrating that it can be done on a district scale. 
and then a city learns from that and expands. And that's exactly what Stockholm is doing, is learning from that and uh, expanding by rebuilding their royal seaport into an even larger um, eco district. It's part of the Clinton Climate Initiative C40 system, and they're taking smart grid as their focus, kind of as an economic development tool as well. And so we see all of these partners in this public-private partnership building out this area block by block. That's the entire area in order to be completely fossil free by 2030. Um, CO2 emissions below one and a half ton per capita and being a leader in smart grid technology, just as we saw Austin trying to be. And once they figure this out and have the technology, they can become one of the key exporters in, the United, in, in Europe of this new technology. So that's leading me um, into green ovation. And again, my focus is on whether you call it an innovation district, an eco district, a living building city district, that we really need to use these more in the United States in order to really capture the innovation that will be allow, allow us to be leaders in new green technology. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Samantha Meza, and I'm one of the sustainability interns. Uh, and I have the honor of introducing our next speaker. A 30-year veteran of the energy industry, Gary Harris is the president of HTS Enterprises a consulting firm that provides diverse energy engineering and power generation technical services, including research, policy, and education services. Gary Harris is also the founder and executive director for Atlanta's Center for Sustainable Communities. He also serves as interim executive director of Emerald City's Collaborative Atlanta. Please welcome Gary Harris. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, way up here in Cincinnati from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, the furthest point north I've been in a while, uh, but it's great being here. I went to an event. The reason why I knew that I was in the north, because I went to a church event on Saturday, and uh, after the event, uh, there was like 70 different dishes of food on three tables and not one piece of fried chicken. So I knew, I knew that I was in the north. So uh, thanks a lot for having me here. But uh, I'm uh, Gary Harris, President and CEO of HCS Enterprises. We're Energy Engineering in Atlanta, Georgia. Also uh, Executive Director for the Center for Sustainable Communities and Executive Director for the uh, Emerald Cities Collaborative. And uh, Emerald Cities is a, uh, as, as, as Joan alluded to in her, in her book, uh, em Emerald Cities is all about making, making cities as, as sustainable as possible. And, and at the Emerald, Emerald Cities Collaborative, we're trying to create high road job approaches, uh, mainly by uh, uh, doing large scale infrastructure jobs as it relates to uh, green infrastructure, sustainability, and retrofitting buildings. And we we're trying to do that in Atlanta and 10 other cities around the country. With the Center for Sustainable Communities, uh, we're all about research, uh, assessment, and specialized projects and programs. And um, we're driving out uh, solutions in, into communities, making them healthy, green, and, and, and sustainable. Uh, so uh, we're working directly in the vein of what you're trying to do here at Xavier. And again, I, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, and, and Metro Atlanta is, is, has a population of about 450,000 people and is striving to be the number one city in, in, in sustainability, not only in, in Georgia, but, 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 but in, in this country at large. And we're doing a bunch of stuff uh, in 10 different areas through, through a program called the Power to Change. And, and, and that program is driving out green spaces, it's driving out recycling, uh, energy efficient, it's making our buildings in downtown Atlanta some of the most energy efficient and high performing in the country. Uh, and we're doing that primarily not only at the, at the local level, from, from, uh, uh, from, from a local level in the city, but also from a regional level as well through a plan called uh, ARC Plan 2040. And again, it looks like creating 
uh, lifelong communities uh, throughout the Atlanta region, uh, communities with, with, with diverse uh, types of housing, with, with transportation, uh, with green spaces, with, with, with uh, community gardens, where you can live and move from one home to the next, to the next, to the next, and never move out, out of a central community. And that's what we're trying, trying to do in, in, in Atlanta, again, through our plan 2040. I want to show you a quick video of that. Uh, that plan and give you a better idea of what we're doing in Atlanta and how we're doing it. I grew up here and after college decided to come back home. I love Atlanta because we're a region of determined dreamers, always imagining possibilities, never content to stand still. Just think, those dreams gave us the busiest airport in the world. They brought us the 1996 Olympic Games, major sports teams, and great companies like CNN, Delta, and Coca-Cola. We have an exciting arts and culture community and a terrific quality of life. So what's next for us? How will we turn it up a notch and pay it forward? My generation wants to know what's in store. We have a real stake in it, and so do you. During the last three years, the Atlanta Regional Commission reached out to thousands of citizens, first to create a vision, and then an ambitious blueprint for the Atlanta region's success. ARC's Plan 2040 is the next leap forward. It capitalizes on five key areas that will make our region thrive. Great places start with great people, and Plan 2040 offers a path to a better quality of life for our 5 million residents and the 3 million more expected during the next 30 years. We are growing more diverse each year, and the aging of the baby boomers will more than double the number of seniors in the region by 2040. Since different people want different things, Plan 2040 calls for community choices, including lifelong communities where young and old can live with the quality services and amenities that they need. New housing options close to jobs and transit are definitely part of the vision. We have great places to live today, from Swanee to Marietta, Fayetteville to Woodstock, and points in between. Metro Atlanta is known to offer a high quality of life and economic vitality. New and expanded programs to enrich our towns neighborhoods and employment centers are vital. The award-winning Livable Centers Initiative has already invested in more than 100 communities throughout the region and will continue to plant seeds to sprout great living environments. Link trips to other cities, the Regional Leadership Institute, and the Model Atlanta Regional Commission will continue to bring diverse people to the leadership table to leverage our strengths and build new ideas together. We've got to keep moving. Great transportation has been a part of Metro Atlanta's DNA from our beginning. And today, we can claim the nation's ninth largest public transit system, the junction of three major interstate highways, the busiest airport, and soon, the largest international air terminal on the planet. We're a transportation center because of proactive planning and investment over the years. We have a chance to continue those region-shaping investments through the Regional Transportation Referendum in July. Plan 2040 will also focus $61 billion to keep our system in good repair and create new options for the future. Think new transit projects, the Beltline, more efficient roads, bike lanes, and sidewalks. It's exciting to think of new ways to zip around our region. Have you ever noticed how green our city is from the air? Parks, paths, and green spaces breathe life into our communities. Plan 2040 promotes the continued greening of Metro Atlanta, our emerald city. It includes strategies to protect our natural, cultural, and historic resources for generations to come. As the region grows, we have to think of the health of our residents and our sustainability. That means preserving and expanding green spaces, using our water wisely, and making sure our air is clean. It's really fundamental.
So, now the hard question. What will drive the new economy of our region? Plan 2040 includes action plans to spur job creation in the fields of digital media, bioscience, and logistics. Fostering economic recovery and long-term prosperity is job one, and the work must begin now. Let's envision and pursue a vibrant region that will attract creative knowledge workers. They will help drive the new global economy and power the Atlanta region 2.0 well into the 21st century. So where do we go from here? I truly believe that Atlanta is the best region on the planet. That's why I'm here. ARC's Plan 2040 ensures that it will stay that way. But it's people like you who will bring that blueprint to life. Join me. Join with the youth of today and tomorrow to make the Atlanta region all it can be. It's not just for you, and it's not just for me. It's for future generations of Metro Atlantans. It's a new day. Let's make it count. Sustainability is not only a job, but, but, but it's an everyday occurrence. I, I, I live at a, at a place called at, at Atlantic Station, as, as Joan alluded to. And I can come out of my condo and walk and get, on, get, get onto a shuttle, and, and in five minutes, I'm at a transit station. Okay? I don't have to hop in a car. There's eight ways to get in and out of Atlantic Station by bike, by ride share, by walking, uh, by cab. Uh, again, without getting, getting into a, a, a personal automobile, uh, I can walk to retail, entertainment, uh, my office. Uh, there's a Target there, which is a large re re retail store. There's a Publix there, which is a grocery store. LA Fitness is there. Everything that I need is in this walkable, sustainable community. And we're trying to replicate that model throughout Atlanta uh, in these lifelong communities. And we have a plan, again, called, called the Power of the Change, which has 30 different uh, criteria that, that, that we're actually uh, implementing in the city of Atlanta against 30 different, uh, against 30, 30, 30 different measures. And uh, we, uh, we, we recently implemented an uh, ambassadors program where we have about 200 companies uh, who are actually tra tracking their uh, sustainability footprint and reporting that to our Office of, of, of Sustainability uh, to, to, to ensure that we're on track with these measures. Not only that, we, we, we've just instituted a recycling ambassadors program as well, where we're actu actually acting as, as ambassadors, going out into the communities, knocking on doors, and encouraging uh, persons to, uh, to, to, to recycle. But at the same time, you know, we, we, we have to ensure that, that our advocacy mechanisms are, are in place and, and we're actually engaging in the, the community in this work of environmental stewardship and we have done that in, in a number of ways in Atlanta and also through our organization, organization as well. The first is we, we've created something called a Just Energy Forum and that's where we, we've, we've brought together seven nonprofit organizations uh, who, who've taken on the task of ensuring that at-risk and disadvantaged communities are engaged in, in, in the process, in the process of, of, of ensuring that, that we have a, a good, reliable mix of energy sources for the future, which won't have impact on future generations. Okay? And we do that by, by, by ensuring that they're part of the integrated resource planning me mechanism uh, uh, put, put forth for by our Public Utilities Commission and also by our local utility. We've also created a Georgia uh, Environmental Justice Forum where we've brought together 20 organizations to, to ensure that there are not disproportionate impacts uh, from from uh, environmental uh, uh, issues in, in the state, in the state, whether it be the siting of, of, of industrial complexes, uh, large scale uh, construction projects, large scale transportation projects, etc., that forum has has come together to, to, to ensure that there, there are ample policies uh, in place uh, and ample mechanisms in place uh, to ensure that environmental justice is, is in the forefront of, of, of every ma major project which occurs in the city of Atlanta and beyond as well. Then there's the Environmental Pe Pe People of Color Forum, or the EPOC, 
which, which we call it in Atlanta as well. That's a forum where, where environmental leaders have, have, have come together who are, who are majority and non-majority backgrounds uh, to, to, to ensure that all persons are included uh, in, in, in the environmental movement and policy making uh, and, and, and also the implementation of, of projects as well. And also through STEM education activities. Uh, we're actually in, in, in the schools teaching uh, kids about water conservation, energy conservation, uh, climate change, et cetera. We just had a green apple day of service uh, at, at, at an elementary school uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a county where we had nearly 100 students uh, teaching them about green build techniques and, and, and sustainability around a coalition of, of about 12 organizations or so. But the city of Atlanta has had a lot of sustainability accomplishments in, in the past year. And some of them include the fact that the recycling tonnage has increased uh, from, from 1,079 tons collected uh, to about, uh, to about 1,400 tons, an increase of 23% internally. Also, uh, we had an original target of about 15% energy savings by, by 2020. That has been exceeded by the Department of, of uh, Watershed Management. And our Atlanta Better Buildings Challenge has grown to include over 70 million square feet, or about 150 buildings in downtown Atlanta, in, in midtown Atlanta, and also Bucket as well. On this Wednesday, Wednesday morning, our organization will, will be assessing six buildings in downtown Atlanta, some 3 million square feet, uh, to, to ensure that they're mo the most energy efficient and, and, and water efficient uh, buildings in, in, in the metro region as well. Again, other things that, that, that we're doing in, in, in the city of Atlanta, we're working with uh, Emory Spellman uh, and also Agnes Scott. And these are all national leaders from, from, from a collegiate perspective. Uh, around environmental sustainability. Uh, matter of fact, at, at, at one college, George Ridge Piedmont College, we've signed a memorandum of understanding where we're going in and performing water uh, audits, energy audits, and, and transforming the entire campus uh, to, to, to a, a completely sustainable venue. Matter of fact, we're bringing students and faculty on the energy audit on, on, on Wednesday morning to be a part of that, that mixture. On this weekend, we're, we're bringing in Toyota, the, the, the car manufacturer, uh, to uh, uh, be, be in an event at Clark Atlanta U U University, where we're bringing in students from 25 colleges from, from around the country and training them to be green ambassadors as well. But, but Atlanta is known for its transportation problems. Okay, you come to Atlanta, you know, the first thing you saw up there as, as part of the ARC program is to fix that problem. And we're doing that. Okay, we're, we're doing, by, doing that by making a more, more robust tra transit system, uh, by by uh, putting in bike paths, by encouraging walking, by uh, organizations su such as ASAP, uh, who, who help to coordinate rides, we're ensuring ride share programs, et cetera. We're actually trying to tackle this, this transportation problem and issue. Uh, Joey alluded to eco districts. We just started that, that, that concept in, in uh, Metro, Metro Atlanta. And that's where you're basically creating many Atlantic stations within neighborhoods, i.e. walkable, sustainable communities. And, and, we, and we do that by, by having a rubric framework of uh, procedures and, and instructions. But first and foremost, there's community engagement. And then through a series of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of steps, uh, we, we transform the, 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 the community from one that's that's not so eco-friendly to one that's very eco-friendly and sustainable. And we were just, just given an MOU with the city of Lithonia, Georgia, uh, to, to transform that, that, that community to a walkable, sustainable community using this eco-district framework. So we're, we're excited about that as well. And other projects in, in, in the city of Atlanta include, include the fact that uh, we're working on the, uh, let's see here. We're working on the Atlanta Beltline project, and, and the Atlanta Beltline project is the is one of the uh, largest re 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 redevelopment projects in the country. Uh, it's like an emerald necklace around the city. Uh, Atlanta itself was was known as terminus uh, uh, several several decades back. That's because a large amount of railroads uh, terminated in, into Atlanta. So in order to ensure that Atlanta was uh, 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 congestion free from a railroad perspective, they built uh, bypasses around the city itself. That necklace is being transformed into green spaces, into uh, light rail, into uh, uh, retail spaces, high density uh, uh, living spaces, etc. around Atlanta, and that's a $3 billion project. That's just some, some of the things that is going on in Atlanta. Again, we're driving to be 
one of the most sustainable cities in the country. So I, so I invite you down to uh, check this out. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Edith Delgado. I am a sustainability intern as well. I proudly present to you Larry Falcon. Larry Falcon has served since 2007 as director of the C City of Cincinnati's Office of Environmental Quality. In that position, Larry leads that the development and implementation of sustainability programs, ensures the city's compliance with environmental regulations, and oversees recycling services for city residents. Larry has more than 25 years of experience as an environmental professional, including positions with the City of Kansas City, Missouri, and the U.S. Environmental Prote Protection Agency. Larry holds a BA from Binghamton University and JD from, P from Pace University. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you to the Xavier Sustainability Committee for having me here today. Um, I think it was Mark Twain who said, if I had uh, more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. And um, it really goes to how much thinking it takes to distill down what you want to say and get it into um, a small package. And that's what I hope to be able to do here today. I've just got a couple of points that I want to make for you. Um, I loved hearing the examples of Stockholm and of Atlanta because there's great s stuff going on, inspiring stuff in both of those cities and so many more cities around the country. Um, to me, when we're talking about sustainability, um, it's a discussion in which place matters. Um, solutions need to be crafted to the specifics of the community that you're in. And Cincinnati is a city that I like to describe as a city that's cursed by its blessings. Uh, what I mean by that is we have cheap and abundant energy being near both the coal fields of West Virginia and the natural gas fields of Ohio. We have cheap and abundant water being on the banks of the, Missouri, uh, the Ohio River where a billion gallons an hour flow past our front door. We have cheap and abundant landfill space um, with plenty of capacity close into the downtown area. And we have cheap and abundant land um, where you can go half, a mile, uh, half an hour out from downtown and buy you know, new three and four family homes for under $200,000. And all of those things make it harder to make sustainability make economic sense. Uh, and yet, here in Cincinnati, we do make since sustainability make economic sense. Um, back in 2008, the city of Cincinnati developed the Green Cincinnati Plan. We just did a five-year update on it. But in that plan, we set the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 2% per year, so 8% by 2012. And we were going to do that while saving more money than it costs, while improving quality of life, while creating jobs. And we succeeded in doing all those things. When we did the five-year update and we did the accounting, we found that we had reduced the entire city's greenhouse gas emissions by 8.2%, just a whisker ahead of our goal, while creating all of those other objectives. Yeah, thank you. Some examples of the things that we have done um, in order to accomplish that objective. We did energy retrofits in city government buildings. Um, and we did it in a way that made economic sense and created jobs. We borrowed $14 million through a performance contract because we had no capital money available for this job. We did energy retrofits of city buildings that are saving us $1.3 million a year in our city's energy budget. We take that $1.3 million pay off the money that we borrowed, and it'll take 12 years to pay off the loan, but from then until forever, the $1.3 million a year is ours to keep in net savings. So we took no money and did energy savings, created 140 jobs, and end up with savings back in our pockets. Similarly, we looked at our recycling program, and we realized that with enhancements to divert more waste from the landfill, we could save money. Every ton we divert from the landfill to recycling saves us about $100 a ton. Now, only 25 of it comes at the landfill. That's our tipping fee. 
but it comes in what we're paid for the value of the recycling materials. It comes in avoided collection and hauling costs. And at $100 per ton, we were able to invest $4 million in our program, create 40 jobs, buy the big green wheeled recycling carts that you all know that we delivered to every eligible household in the city. And the net result was reducing the cost of our trash program a million dollars a year, giving us net savings of $500,000 a year. So even though our landfills are cheap, we can pull material out of those landfills and make a profit at it here in Cincinnati. Electricity aggregation. The old way of doing it was each household, each business, bought electricity one at a time from Duke Energy and paid the going rate, whatever Duke charged. What we realized is that if we banded together and formed a buyer's cooperative, if you will, we could get a much better deal. And so the city, with the permission of the voters, pooled all of the electrical demand from all the residential and small commercial accounts. We went out and shopped for electricity on behalf of 60,000 accounts. And we were able to deliver the citizens of Cincinnati with energy 23% cheaper than what they were paying before and do that with 100% renewable, 100% green energy. That made us EPA's Green Power Community of the Year for 2013. So, you know, the kind of thing, even though our electricity is only six cents a kilowatt hour, some of the cheapest in the nation, we were able to cut those rates by 23%. Um, and then there's some smaller scale examples, like the new police station that we're getting ready to build. We went out to bid for our new police station. We got a bid for a lead gold facility that fit within our budget. But that lead gold, but the same bidder said, you know, for a little more money, we'll make it lead platinum and we'll make it net zero energy. And we said, okay, a net zero energy police station, how much more? Now, it doesn't fit within our construction budget. Where do we get that money from? We borrow against our future utility bills. Instead of paying utility bills for that police station for the next 20 years, instead we take out a loan that's going to cost us less than those utility bills, and that's enough to take the police station to net zero energy. So those are the ways that we make it make economic sense in, C in Cincinnati. Now, environmental justice. Most sustainability work is sort of automatically environmental justice work. We're saving money, we're creating jobs, um, we're eliminating waste, and that's good for the whole community. But there are times when it's sustainability work does not support environmental justice. And those are the places that we have to be conscious of and have to focus our attention. For example, we're in the process of launching a PACE financing program, which is a little bit complicated. I won't get into the details of it, but it's a way of financing energy efficiency work with no upfront money, just like I told you about. But when you do that work, the question is, the jobs you're creating, what kind of jobs are they? There's a disagreement within our community about whether every single one of those PACE projects needs to pay a prevailing wage which is a state wage standard that's at about you know, 25 to $35 an hour, depending upon the building trade, or whether we're willing to accept some of those jobs paying less than a prevailing wage. And because the community is not united on that issue, the program is stalled until we figure out how to solve that controversy and how good a job is a good enough green job to make us willing to create it in our community. An important question and not an easy question. Similar example, um, we're looking for a way to beneficially reuse the food waste in our community. So we created a food waste composting facility. It was called Compost Cincy. It was located on a former landfill site within the city limits. It was diverting 40,000 tons of food waste a year from the landfill. And it was creating odors that were a burden to its surrounding neighbors. And many of those were low-income communities. And so what do we do about that? You know, it's our sustainability objectives coming right up against our justice objectives. And so we have closed that facility, 
and we're now developing an anaerobic digester facility so that we can bring that same material into closed vessels, create the compost, create renewable energy, and not burden the community. It's a little more expensive, it's a little more work, takes a little more engineering and planning, but it's what we have to do in order to create green jobs, reutilize our resources, and do it in a way that doesn't burden our community. So, in conclusion, um, what I want to say is just that the green economy works here in Cincinnati. It can be made to work for all Cincinnatians, and if it works here, it's going to work anywhere. Thank you.